You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the U.S. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another episode of some murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. Before we start, we would love to give a huge shout out to our newest patron members, Jen Dooby Dubby, Dooby, Dooby Dooby Doo, sorry, Cassia Kobeck, and JS. Thank you all. Very, very much. Thank you so much. If you want to know more about Patreon and other ways to support the podcast, please listen until the end. That's when we're going to tell you about the different ways you can help. And we'll also tell you about the Patreon perks, like our lovely monthly get-togethers, which recently got an entire makeover. It's amazing, but we'll talk more about that later. Because now it's time for the second part of the heinous crimes of German serial killer Karl Hopf. That's right. And if you haven't listened to last week's episode, please do that first, because otherwise you'll be missing a lot of information. And if you already listened last week, then Annie will show me now that she remembers what happened, because she will give you a super quick recap. That's right. Okay, let's dive into the life of Karl Ludwig Heinrich Emanuel Hopf, who was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1863. He was a typical middle-class kid, brought up with good old-fashioned values like hard work and faith. Education was a big deal in his family, so he dabbled in everything from pharmacy to fencing, showing off his wide range of interests. Also roller skating for some reason. He's such a bon vivant. In his young adult years, he travels to London, but also to more adventurous places like India and Morocco. But he contracts malaria and has to return home to Frankfurt without much to his name. Thanks to his father, he is able to open his own business, and so he opens a pet food store and even gets into breeding those big, lovable St. Bernards. He also made sure to have a well equipped lab at home, first of all, to study mange and canine distemper, he tried to find a cure for these very serious diseases, but also because he liked to collect all the different kinds of bacilli. But does he have a happy life as a roller skating fencing instructor with his many dogs? No, he does not. No. Instead, things take a dark turn. His firstborn son, a child born out of wedlock, died, official reason being an abscess tooth. Elisa, the mother of the child, who was also Karl Hopf's maid, also fell severely ill, and then his father died unexpectedly. But that was not all. His first wife, Josefa, died shortly after taking out a life insurance policy on her. His next marriage isn't any luckier. His young wife, Christine, falls severely ill, their infant daughter dies, and people start to gossip. Christine's father reports his son-in-law for murder and attempted murder, but the investigation doesn't get far. Karl Hopf faces zero consequences. Quite the contrary, he starts suing everyone, calling him a murderer, and he wins. Oh, this guy. And that brings us to wife number three, Vali. And that's where we let off last week, right when Vali had broken into her husband's locked desk and found all of the secrets, from the love letters that were written while they had been already married, to his little side hustle in the adult industry. He had produced quite a repertoire of pornographic photos, and he himself starred in them with different women. He tried to disguise himself with a mask and a hat, but of course Vali knew her husband and his socks. Also, can I please tell you, one of these actual photos is in the book Johanna used for her main source, and so she took a picture of it and sent it to me, and, um, yeah. As I expected, the mask does make everything worse. It's so bad. It's like, I don't, if you were imagining initially a Zorro mask in your mind, think again, friends. Think again. It's more like if it was craft time with grandma. At least, listen, this is what it looks like in the photo. 
All I can tell you is what it looked like in the photo. It looked like if it was craft time with grandma and she had some paper doilies, like the kind that you put on a tray to put the cookies on before you take it to church. And she was like, let's make crafts out of doilies. It looked like he folded a doily in half and then taped it to his face. It's awful. It's a little bit like this um, Venetian mask, not the ornate ones, not the beautifully painted ones, more like the the just average that had, you know, where you have the mask, kind of sorrow mask, but then everything under your eyes is covered like with a little curtain. You know what I mean? Oh, there's a curtain there? Yeah. All right. I got to look more closely because it looks like a doily. It looks like a bright white doily over his. It's like his. a face curtain so that it, it's, it's, whole face it's is a covered. terrible face curtain. Yeah. That's not good. It's not good, you guys. It's really not good. It's, um, listen, I am not, I am not a uh, expert on adult material, but this is not a sexy picture. <laughs> It's not. It's not. Well, I think back then they didn't have so so much um, competition. <laughs> I think you must be right because it's terrible. It's all terrible. Terrible, terrible. But thanks to Vali's snooping, this whole facade crumbles faster than a cookie in milk. It's such a good Keith Morrison comparison. <laughs> and this reveals the true colors of an extremely dangerous guy. And that is where we left off last week. That's right. The sources are the same as last week. And as always, you'll find them in the according album. And the book Annie mentioned, my main source for this case, is titled Frankfurter Giftmorde, der Fall Karl Hopf by Thomas Schnipf. All right. So Walli found all the incriminating evidence, everything about her husband's debts, his cheating, the photos. And the next morning, while sipping her tea, she confronts him and tells him about everything she found. And her husband is speechless at first, and Vali starts crying and has to leave the room for a moment, you know, to calm herself down a little bit. And when she returns, she keeps drinking her tea that she had left on the table, and she expects her husband to say something. But instead, she starts to feel nauseated. Thank you, Tilda, I didn't know that. And she feels weak. No. Yes. No. And, and now a horrible suspicion creeps up. She immediately, she's a smart one, this Valley, she immediately suspects Carl of trying to poison her. And Carl replies that she probably put something in her tea herself to get him into trouble. But he's nice. He helps her, to, uh, he helps her over to the bedroom where Valley has to lie down because she's incapable of standing or even sitting upright. And then Carl tells her that it's probably only the shock and that she needs to calm down. That's all, that always works in a, in a, when a couple is fighting to tell the woman to calm mm. down. Yeah. It's a great way to escalate, <laughs> escalate something. <laughs> Vali falls asleep. And when she wakes up again, she feels a little bit better. She feels strong enough to get up. And so, so she sneaks over to the kitchen where she still sees the cup of tea standing on the table. And as I said, she's a smart one, so she pours the remaining tea in a small bottle and hides it. Good girl. Nice. She also sees that Carl has boarded his desk up, like really he nailed some boards onto the drawers and sealed it with some wax. <laughs> yeah. And that's not suspicious at all. Yeah. <laughs> he, he put a hair in the door, so he knew if she opened it, the hair wouldn't be there anymore. He home alone his office. He tells Valle that he will actually report her for breaking in. <laughs> and Valle is like, you know what? Fine by me. We can head over to the police station together and I report you for attempted murder. And Carl replies that if she reports him to the police, he will end his own life by taking poison himself. Mm -hmm. And thank God she's not impressed by the manipulation tactics of this rollerblading red flag of a man. And she <laughs> takes the bottle with the tea and she walks over to the police station. Yes, Vali. I love that she's just not going to have any of this gaslighting. Yes. She is not having it. And so they forward the sample to a chemist to get it checked. And then Vali heads home and calls the family's doctor to come and examine her. And the doctor comes and he tries to check the young woman thoroughly, but unfortunately Carl is right next to them the whole time and he just doesn't shut 
up. He keeps talking and talking and telling how they had a lover's bed in the morning and that now his wife is so stressed and upset. And the doctor, a man of his time apparently, prescribes her something to calm her down, which, let's be honest, in 1912 could have very well been heroin. And he tells her to not be too upset about any of Yeah, this. have some quieting drugs, lady. A couple of days later, she's called to the lab to get the result for the toxicology screening of the tea, and they found absolutely nothing. They tell her to go home and apologize to her poor husband, who she suspected for no reason at all. They really tell her to apologize. Right. I was she like, over my dead body, make sure you autopsy me. <laughs> Autopsy me. No, she she didn't say that. But I did not see that coming. I thought for sure that tea was going to be full of poison and that would have been it. I think the difficulty was, well, we're going to talk more about that in a, in a little while, but I think the difficulty was that it's not like today where they have like modern technology to do mm. a, a broader screening. They needed to know what to look for, apparently. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So Vali returns home, but she's obviously still super suspicious. And she asks her husband to cancel the life insurance he had taken out on her, because that would make her feel a little bit better. But he refuses. And in the beginning of August, Vali falls sick again, and Carl cares for her. He brings her food and milk to drink, and he takes her temperature, and she's running a high fever. She feels nauseous or nauseated. She feels weak. And... She has a constant headache. We all know the symptoms by now. It's always the same. And of course, she is still certain that her husband is actually trying to poison her. And so she musters all her strength and she takes the milk he serves her every day and takes it to get screened for poison again. And at the lab, they pretty much roll their eyes at her because to them, she's just another woman with a wandering uterus who should be sedated or lobotomized, I guess. And I'm putting thoughts in their heads now. I have no idea if that's what they thought, but we know that they were kind of annoyed. But they did examine the milk and again found nothing. Vali's condition wouldn't improve. Some days she would feel better, some days she would feel worse. And no medication, of course, prepared by her loving and very caring husband, the pharmacist, seemed to help her. Another doctor was called and, thank God, just that day Karl Hopf had an appointment and couldn't be next to his wife while she was examined. And she told the physician about her suspicion and finally this was someone who took her serious. Vali was taken to a hospital immediately where after weeks and weeks she finally started to recover. It was a very slow recovery though. And at the hospital the doctors and nurses came to the same conclusion. This woman had been poisoned. Now, they only needed to find the toxin that had been used on her. Finally, even the police believed Valle, of course, only because male doctors backed her up. And they started an undercover investigation. Everything Carl brought to the hospital whenever he visited his wife, so flowers, chocolates, everything he touched, everything was taken and examined. Karl Hopf himself was under constant surveillance. Nice. About time. On 14th of April 1913, they finally arrest Karl Hopf on his way to visit his wife who is still at the hospital. They take him to the police station for interrogation and they also search him and they do indeed find something very interesting in one of the pockets of his coat. A small bottle of cyanide. I know we mostly talked about arsenic in our cases, but I know we also had at least one case where potassium cyanide was used. I just can't remember which one. I know it wasn't Mata oh. Marek. Any do you remember? I don't. I'm sure there's been more than one, but I can't think on the spur of the moment, you know, specifically. I keep thinking of arsenic stuff, but I know we've talked about cyanide. Yeah. It, it doesn't really matter which one. But for those of you who don't really remember, just like me, potassium cyanide is a highly toxic chemical compound. It's a white crystalline solid that is soluble in water. Potassium cyanide is widely used in various industrial processes, including gold mining, electroplating, and organic synthesis. However, more important for us, it is infamous for its extreme toxicity. Even small amounts of potassium cyanide can be lethal if ingested, inhaled or absorbed through the skin as it interferes with the body's ability to use oxygen. Nowadays, thank God, it is tightly regulated in many countries. 
So they start to question Karl Hopf, and at first they only ask about the pornographic photos he made. And Karl Hopf relaxes immediately. He tells them that yeah, he made these photos, but only for himself to enjoy. They ask him about his hobbies, his income, his fencing, his performances as Atos, and then they ask him how it's possible that he took out a life insurance on his own wife with an annual fee of more than 4,000 mark. How was this a smart financial move and how was he even able to afford any of this year after year because he intended of paying the insurance fee every year, right? Right? Like, it's not like you only intended right. it to pay this once. <laughs> right, Carl? Right? You were planning to do this for decades, Carl, right? And at first, Karl Hopf gets super defensive and tells them that it's none of their business. And now they tell him straightforward that he's under arrest for poisoning his wife. And they ask him why he was carrying the bottle of cyanide with him. And Karl Hopf admits that he had the poison with him in case of an imminent arrest to take it himself. He had been prepared for a while already. But the way he had been arrested had left him no time to actually see his plan through. It's interesting, potassium cyanide due to its extremely high toxicity and the quick death was used very often as means to suicide. We know it from stories about spies, for example, or high-ranking politicians and military members in wartime. So basically, whenever you didn't want to be called alive by the enemy or authorities. Mm -hmm. Or tortured for information. Exactly, yeah. Both Adolf Hitler and Josef Goebbels, along with their respective spouses and family members, used cyanide as means of suicide towards the end of World War II. On 30th of April 1945, Adolf Hitler committed suicide by gunshot, but also ingested a cyanide capsule in his bunker in Berlin. Josef Goebbels, who was Hitler's minister of propaganda, followed suit the next day after Hitler's death, and he and his wife Magda Goebbels also used cyanide to end their lives after poisoning their six children with morphine. Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, I think the L pill or the lethal pill, as we know it for war and things like that, but we also just mentioned serial killer Leonard Lake briefly, who had hidden cyanide on his person and used it the moment he was arrested. So yeah. True. I forgot yeah, about that. True. That's still a tactic used today by modern serial killers. Yeah. And um, the investigators even asked Karl Hopf why he was so worried about an arrest just for producing pornographic material. Right. It's not that serious. Right. But yeah, he didn't have an answer for that. The investigators pretty much kept Hopf in the dark about how much they knew, which was honestly not a lot. While the doctors did agree that Valley had been poisoned, they still had absolutely no idea what had been used on her. So the police officers kept extra vague about the evidence they had and tried to get Hopf to admit everything by telling him that if he wouldn't confess, he would be definitely sentenced to death, but that a confession would mitigate his sentencing. We, we all know the spiel by now. Yeah. Who hasn't heard that old spiel? Yeah. <laughs> And now, after hours and hours of questioning, Karl Hopp finally breaks down, a little bit at least, and admits to poisoning his wife, Valley with arsenic and digitalis poison. Mm -mm. Now, you might all know foxglove. A uh, beautiful, a beautiful but possibly deadly plant. I had one in our fenced in front yard where nobody could touch it by accident and where it was away from the dogs. And I loved it, and unfortunately, it didn't come back one spring. But they are so pretty. so pretty. They are. We had foxgloves here, and I think they also didn't come back one spring. But I didn't replant them just because of the toxicity issues. Yeah. So um, I checked just for some basic, basic information. Foxglove contains compounds called cardiac glycosides, such as uh, digoxin and digitoxin, which... And that's very interesting. I think they have both therapeutic and toxic effects on the heart. Uh, as Paracelsus rightfully said, back in the day, dosis sola facit venenum, which means the dose makes the poison, right? Mm -hmm. So in small doses, these compounds are used medicinally to treat various heart conditions, particularly congestive heart failure and certain irregular heart rhythm problems. However, in higher doses, digitalis can be highly toxic and even fatal. Symptoms of digitalis poisoning may include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, 
confusion and that's interesting visual disturbances which means that most likely you're gonna see yellow or green halos around objects isn't that fascinating that is fascinating irregular heart rhythms because you take something that could help you if you have irregular heart rhythms but will make irregular heart rhythms if you don't have irregular heart rhythms it's a whole thing yeah <laughs> and uh, potentially <laughs> fatal arrhythmias It's important to note that while digitalis plants have medicinal properties, please, they should only be used under the guidance of a qualified healthcare professional. You're not just going to eat foxglove. Just no, get, no, no, get no, the, no, no. Get the medication yeah. prescribed if you please. need it. Uh, yeah, because as we said, improper use can lead to poisoning. Oh, I can't believe he was poisoning with... So many, but it makes sense that he would go on multiple different compounds, right? Because that's his, that's kind of his thing. But I'm just so glad that that creepy mask wearing little fuckboy was finally found out. You know, he was just, mm -mm, I don't like the mask. I'm not anti-mask. I'm just this particular, you'll, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's so it's already in the album. <laughs> it is. That's right. It's in the Facebook group. So Karl Hopf signed a written confession and was transferred to jail where he would now await his trial. And of course, they searched Hopf's apartment and they found quite an interesting collection of various poisons. Uh, the bottles only marked with a letter. So, for example, A for arsenic, S for strychnine and so on. Oh, it's the Sue Grafton style. <laughs> Howie. I guess he came first, but yeah. They also found his bacilli samples. What I also read is that he was, he was not, well, I was just going to say it, he was a pig. He didn't keep his samples clean and tidy and, and sterile. He was, he was horrible. He was a horrible pharmacist, apparently. Uh. They also found various whips, crops, rug beaters. Do you call them rug beaters? Like a paddle to spank someone. Yeah, yeah. These paddles that you use to clean the rugs back in the day. Well, you still get them here. They still are used. I'm sure you can probably, I, we usually just used a broom. Yeah, okay. But you know what I mean. I do. Yeah, they also found sexy underwear for women, not for him. Uh, <laughs> hidden, all hidden in a box in the back of the, in the back of the closet. All props for his photographic, pornographic side hustle. Now, finally, the doctors and lab employees knew what they needed to look for in the toxicology screening. And they found that Valley had not only been poisoned with arsenic, but also that Karl Hopf had infected his wife with typhoid on purpose. I had a feeling that when you said last week about him having bacteria, and I just thought, oh no, because tuberculosis, strep throat, all kinds of illnesses are, are, are bacillus, bacilli bacteria. This is. Mm -hmm. Oh, he used them on his victims. He really did. Oh, apparently, well, they can't, they couldn't prove it, but apparently also probably on his uh, second wife, Christina, who died from tuberculosis after they had divorced. The one I was so happy had gotten out mm. her turbo. Oh, okay. Don't you have the feeling back then it would have been the perfect crime in a way because so many things could not be treated properly and would be mostly fatal? And who would suspect someone being infected with typhoid or tuberculosis on purpose? Nobody. No, Nobody. And not people at that died time. from these diseases all the time. All the time. And now all that I time. said it out loud, I just thought how that, how that wasn't used more often to murder people. And then my next thought was, well, who says it hasn't been used more often and we just don't know? Well... That's a very disturbing thought, but you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. Not everybody was like a pharmacist or, or somebody who, who had access to um, bacteria, but wouldn't it be enough to like get a, a handkerchief from somebody who has tuberculosis and smear it somewhere where your spouse would get sure. infected? Something yeah, like that. Yeah, of course. There would be It's ways. It's not that hard. No. They also exhumed the bodies of his first wife, Josefa, uh, of his daughter, Elsa, uh, the one from his second marriage, and Karl Hopf admitted to poisoning them with arsenic as well. 
Then they exhumed the bodies of the illegitimate son, Karl, as well as the bodies of his father and his second wife, Christina. As I said, she had been dead at that time. She died after the divorce. And they also examined the ashes of Karl Hopf's mother. And they found high traces of arsenic in all of them. Ah, uh, okay. So they were able to prove high traces of arsenic in the ashes back in 1913. That's a surprise. Yeah, that's, well, that's actually fascinating. I don't want to get into too much detail because it involves experiments on dogs. Ah, uh, And thank we're not you. here for that. Nope. But this case was the case that first made this even a thing. Okay. I can imagine what was done and how they figured it all out. Yeah, I just we, we don't have to get into details. No, not at all. I was just yeah, I wanted to make sure it wasn't like a byproduct of fire. That kind of thing, you know. So last week I mentioned a forensic specialist, Dr. Georg Pop. Yeah. Uh he was the one who was trying to find traces of poison in Christina's urine and vomit, you remember? I do. So Georg Pop, who lived from 31st of July 1861 to 15th of February 1943, was a German chemist and professor at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt. And he was actually one of the pioneers of microscopic and scientific criminalistics, contributing to the development of modern forensic medicine. Pop, for example, formulated the Pop principle, which states, the differences in soils from place to place provide valuable clues to prove the connection between a suspect and a crime scene. Isn't that amazing? I'm pretty sure that every one of us who is interested in true crime and forensics knows that this is always important evidence. And this here is the guy who figured it out. Yeah, that's very cool. Lots of flashbacks to the television show Bones. It's a good one. But yeah, this principle underscores the significance of soil analysis in forensic investigation. We know that soil composition varies depending on factors like geology, climate, vegetation, human and animal activity, and so there are distinct characteristics in soil from different locations. And by analyzing soil samples from crime scenes and comparing them to samples taken from suspects or other relevant locations, forensic scientists can hopefully, potentially, establish connections or associations between individuals and crime scenes. It's, it's cool. Yes, and Pop emphasized the importance of considering a wide range of factors in soil analysis, including mineralogical, chemical, biological, uh, and physical properties. By carefully examining soil samples and interpreting the data in context, forensic investigators can gather really valuable evidence to support criminal investigations. But that's not all. It gets even better. He was instrumental in several notable criminal cases, and I'm going to name a few here. So, for example, the Dish case from 1904, uh, where Pop used microphotography to analyze a red silk thread found under the victim's fingernail, contributing to the conviction of the perpetrator, 1904 people. Wow. The Kroll case from 1905, where Pop's microscopic examination of nasal mucus helped solve a murder case by identifying specific particles in the suspect's handkerchief that matched the agricultural activities of the crime scene. So there was like soil or dust in yeah. his mucus. That's gross, but fascinating. Yeah. The Filbert case from 1908, Pop's analysis of soil samples found on the suspect's shoes helped link him to the crime scene demonstrating the significance of soil composition in forensic investigations. Then, in 1921, the Seifert case, Pop's analysis of organic residues on the suspect's clothing, contributed to the conviction of Leonard Seifert for murder. I, I find that so, like, wow. Ahead of its time. Additionally, Pop was also involved in, his, in the establishment of the first chemical police laboratory in Dresden in 1911, making a significant development in forensic science. So Georg Pop is one of the OGs in forensic investigations and his contribution to forensic chemistry and the dedication to advancing forensic techniques have definitely left a lasting impact on the field of criminal investigations. And now he was working on the Hopf case, and he was able to prove arsenic in the ashes of Hopf's mother. That was never done before. 
prosecution figured they now had enough evidence and the trial started on 12th of January 1914, uh, which was a Friday at the Landesgericht in Frankfurt am Main. I meant to ask you last week and I forgot. Is that the formal name for the city of Frankfurt, Frankfurt am Main? Is that the main river? Is it comparable to like Stratford on Avon? I feel like I should know this or you already told me. I'm just... Not 100% sure. Well, the thing with Frankfurt, the, why you say Frankfurt am Main, which is the official name, is because there is another Frankfurt in Germany, Frankfurt an der Oder. So ah. Frankfurt at the River Oder. That's why you have to make the distinction. You don't need to say like, for example, that's Wien an der Donau or that's I understand. an der Isar. Yeah, totally understand. But Frankfurt am Main, so you know which Frankfurt, which Frankfurt we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I know most people probably know that, but I'm... I'm not sure. I'm not sure that most people know that there are two different Frankfurts. Well, I'd say outside of Europe. Yeah. Probably. I think the Frankfurt am Main is the, the one... Uh, is it the main? <laughs> is it the main, main one? The Frankfurt on the and the Oder is in the former Eastern Germany. Okay. So back to the trial. Of course, the street was filled with looky loos who were hoping to catch a glimpse of the murderer because he was considered guilty by most people already. Karl Hopf was represented by Dr. Hugo Sinzheimer, so he was a very experienced defense attorney who had been assigned as a public defender in this case by the judge Dr. Heldmann. Karl Hopf was, of course, completely broke and couldn't afford any other attorney, but from all I read, he pretty much lucked out with Sintheimer. Also present were 27 possible jurors, and from those they chose 12 jurors and two alternative or spare jurors. And, of course, only men were allowed to be jurors back in the day because women could not be trusted to make such important decisions about life and death. Of course not. Their heads could explode. <laughs> Let's not get let's not get reckless here, people. I think it's so interesting how those trial setups change over time, like in Austria nowadays, and I assume it's very similar in Germany. We have three judges and two plus one spare juror um, jurors, and they are called Schöffen in German. And if the trial is for a crime that would have a maximum sentence of four years in prison, so four years or less, it's even just one judge. Uh, like when I was a juror two years ago. In the States, you have 12 jurors in criminal cases, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, I think that's that's about the gist of it. There will be alternates and the number might vary from, you know, civil to criminal trial and that sort of thing. But essentially, it's going to be 12. So Karl Hopf was standing trial for four murders, the murder of his father, his son, his first wife, and his daughter, and for three attempted murders of his second wife, his third wife, and his mother. I assume that even though they had found high traces of arsenic in his mother's ashes, they couldn't prove without reasonable doubt that she had actually died from arsenic poisoning. Karl Hopf, by the way, renounced all his confessions and declared himself not guilty. Mm. When asked about the death of his first child, Karl, and how they had found high traces of arsenic in his remains, Karl Hopf claimed that he had injected the child with arsenic after his death. His reasoning uh, was that he wanted to slow down the decay during the time before the burial, and of course that made no sense because it couldn't explain how the arsenic would have been found in the bones. Only if the child would have been given arsenic while still alive, it would have been able to spread throughout the body, right? Right, yeah. It's systemic. When asked about his father's death uh, and the reason for the high traces of arsenic in his remains, Karl Hopf claimed that his father used to drink some special mineral water, I think it was Offenbacher mineral water, and that it was known that this water had uh, was polluted with arsenic or had high traces of arsenic. Uh, the judge was a little bit speechless about this because he replied that he too likes to drink exactly that mineral water and he never heard of such a thing. Uh -huh. I see. Granted, uh, these things were not unlikely back then, but I say that's a whole lot of accidental arsenic poisoning in Hopf's family for anyone to believe this. Now we're coming to his first wife, Josefa, and the reason of why she had been ingesting arsenic. And for long-time listeners, this will give you a huge throwback to the Victorian death trip episode. 
Of course, Karl Hopp was not to blame for this death either because Josefa loved to take beauty remedies that contained arsenic. I see. Wow. So, yeah, we talked about that several times. Arsenic has a long and notorious history in beauty and cosmetic practices, particularly during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Despite its toxic nature, arsenic was believed to have cosmetic benefits and was used in various beauty remedies, primarily for skin and complexion enhancements. So, beside its use in blush and powders, it was mostly used in various skin creams and ointments, also often marketed as beauty creams or skin tonics. Uh, These products claimed to improve the skin's appearance and texture, But the biggest issue was that once you stopped using it, you would get worse skin problems. And so you had to keep using arsenic and upping the dosage as well. It was also used in hair removal cream. And yeah, it would remove all your hair. All your hair. Probably also your teeth. How do you feel about teeth retention? Arsenic compounds were occasionally added to products intended to darken or enhance eyelashes and eyebrows, although the safety and effectiveness of such products were, I'd say, more than questionable. I think that particularly is one that women would shudder at today. Like, not my eyelashes and my eyebrows. The funny thing is, I just read recently, you know, how for a while eyelash serums were a huge thing in the last couple of years? Mm Mm-hmm. And there is one ingredient that some of them had, or still have, I don't know. That's kind of, I might be completely incorrect. I I think it was kind of a hormone or something they put in. And yeah, it would make your eyelashes grow, but it would also probably, or it could also change the color of your eyes from light to dark, irreversible. Yeah. And give you like sunken in eyes and, and eye bags, irreversible. So I rather have non-long eyelashes and use mascara for that than yeah any of the side effects. But yeah, it's horrible. I always just think of how medicine or beauty remedies that we think are safe nowadays will be looked upon in 10, 20, 100 years. Who knows? Who can oh, say? Oh yeah, of course. We laugh at these women, but they're going to laugh at us too. I think especially with a lot of the like, I don't know, I worry about how permanent things people are doing these days are. Certain things. Buccal fat removal? Yeah. Do it. No, I think it's a mistake. I don't think we're really laughing. We're horrified. No, I'm totally horrified. I I mean, I've been laughing about his porn habits, but I'm not laughing about anything else. He is... I'm laughing about the rollerblading. The roller skating and the... Yeah, and the fencing while rollers... I don't know. There's, There's a lot to mock him for, let's be honest. It's all horrible. And yes, of course, it's possible that she ingested the arsenic because she wanted to have nice glowy skin and no more teeth. But there's just too much arsenic poisoning going on here. Yeah, it's too much. He's either a poisoner or the unluckiest son of a bitch who ever lived. It's too many dead people. It's too many. Too many. Yeah. Too many. Too many, and he had explanations for all of them. His second wife, Christina, well, she took arsenic for her pregnancy nausea. His daughter, Elsa, well, she was clearly poisoned as an embryo by Christina, who kept taking the arsenic for Um, her pregnancy nausea. The audacity. His mother, well, he had given her arsenic drops for her dog, who was suffering from some eye problems, and he thinks that his mother was sure that if it was good for the dog, it would be good for her as well to take the drops. Hmm. The only one who was not to blame, never ever, in any of the deaths, was poor, innocent, roller-fencing Karl Hoff. He just wanted to slice up apples with his saber and wear a kinky mask in kinky photos. That's it. That's it. And you know what? That's not too much to ask for. We wish you'd only done that, Karl Hoff. Quick side note, in the book by Thomas Schnepf, uh, I read that the judge had made a remark about arsenic being also referred to as Erbschaftspulver, which translates to heritage powder. And I checked, I never heard that before, I checked, and yes, people used to call arsenic Erbschaftspulver. Don't you find it extremely unsettling that murdering your family to inherit something, using arsenic was at least common enough to give it the, the name, the nickname Erbschaftspulver? Yeah. Yeah, listen, I'm going to say it again. 
If he'd just been happy as a fencing roller skating magician with a porn side hustle, things would have been fine. They would have been fine. But no, he got greedy. I just can't ever imagine killing your family for financial gain. That to me is, I I can't fathom of it. I just can't. No, it's awful that that was so common. But then could we compare that to, as we talk about trends coming and going all the time, like how many different phrases were there for getting roofied as a woman in the 90s and 2000s? Oh, true. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, not only the German media talked about the trial, it really made international news, uh, news, especially as I found a lot of newspaper articles from Australia, I think because they had a quite big German community over there. And I think my favorite article actually comes from an Australian newspaper, The Sun, from Wednesday, February 18th, 1914, page 5. Quote, a German bluebeard, arsenic for the complexion, typhus and cholera bacilli, from our special representative. London, January 16th. A German bluebeard is standing his trial at Frankfurt on Main, Frankfurt am Main, for a series of crimes which might have appalled even the callous deeming he is accused of having poisoned his father in 1895, his illegitimate child in 1896, his first wife in 1902, his legitimate child in 1906, and between times of having attempted to poison his second wife, his mother, and his third wife. He is a man of 50 years of age. He was brought up as an apprentice to a chemist in London between 1884 and 1889 when he went to Morocco. And there he became enamored of the cabaret, and after some years returned to London as a music hall artist of very little distinction. Falling on the boards, he returned to Germany and dabbled in chemistry. He had a laboratory, and when the members of his family commenced to die mysteriously, neighbors said nasty things. Karl Hopf, for that was his name, instituted libel actions. So the German detective force started out on his trail. They found that he had in his laboratory not only morphium, opium and arsenic, but typhus, cholera and other bacilli, which he had obtained by post from Vienna. (laughs) Oh no. I don't know how true that is. I just like this part. That's why I'm reading it to you. He had even sought to profit from the Balkan War by obtaining cholera bacilli from the Bulgarian battlefields. On the death of his mother, he inherited large sums of money and he had had the premonition to take out very heavy insurance policies on the lives of his wives. The bodies of his victims, when exhumed, were found to contain arsenic. Hopf, with colossal coolness in a written confession, stated that his first wife had taken it to make her beautiful, while his second wife took it as a medicine on his advice. He explained that he had injected arsenic after death into the bodies of the children in order to preserve them. And he admitted that he had given his present wife arsenic and a change of diet, cholera and typhus typhus bacilli because he wanted to see how they worked. One way and another, Karl Hopf deserves to be ranked amongst the human fiends of history, end quote. Yeah. They also printed a photo of Karl Hopf and his assistant from the Varieté Act as Athos, and I'll share that one in the recording album. He's wearing a fantasy uniform. During the second day of the trial, the public was not allowed in the courtroom because this was the day they were talking about Karl Hopf's sex life. Oh my. And this was considered too shocking for the God-fearing people of Germany. Witnesses that day were several sex workers who had been hired by Karl Hopf regularly, some just for his private amusement, others to model for the pornographic photos. The woman testified that Karl Hopf liked to be dominated, that he liked them to spank him and ride on his back. They were shown the mask and his favorite and other stuff from the apartment and they said they recognized the stuff. Again, funny how times change and how nowadays most of this would be considered rather tame. And when you go even further back, I don't know, to antiquity, it would be considered not shocking at all. I don't know. I just always find it fascinating how everything comes and goes in circles, round and round. Absolutely. (laughs) Anyway, the women also testified that Hopf was a known so-called Engelmacher, so uh, that would translate to angel maker which is basically a back alley abortionist. 
And I really don't want to get into any debate of pro or con abortion or whatever. I just want to tell you his method. So he would fill the syringe with soap water and poison, and then he would insert the syringe in the vaginal canal into the uterus, and he would inject the liquid mixture into the uterus. And according to Karl Hopf, this method worked almost every time. Oh, yeah. And I think we can all imagine, first of all, what almost means. Yeah. Because that means that, yeah, there were consequences when it didn't work. Uh, we can also all imagine how horrible this practice must have been. And this is unfortunately the kind of things people come up with when there is no safe and legal way to do it. That's right. And this abortion business brought him a six-month prison sentence, by the way, which didn't matter much because he was already in prison. The trial lasted until 19th of January 1914, and all in all, they called 64 witnesses and experts to testify. Now, if you want to know about each trial day in absolute detail, I can highly recommend the book by Thomas Schnepf. I think it's only available in German, though. But he went through the transcripts and archives, and he has a lot of detail on the witnesses and their testimonies each day. It would be way too much for us, though, to go into everything here. But don't worry, I gave you all the basic info that you need. I think we all agree that he was guilty. And thank God, the judge and the jury thought so as well. Yeah. This article talks about the verdict. It's from the Birmingham Evening Mail from 19th of January 1914, uh, a Monday, page 4. Quote, German poisoning trial. Hopf sentenced. Karl Hopf, the druggist's assistant who became fencing master, was convicted on Saturday at Frankfurt on Main of having murdered his first wife and having attempted to murder his second and third wives and his two children. He was acquitted of the charge of having attempted to murder his father and mother. Uh, he was sentenced to death for the murder of his wife and to 15 years imprisonment for the attempt to murder. The defendant preserved an entirely apathetic demeanor when the jury gave their verdict, and when asked if he had anything to say before judgment was pronounced, answered calmly and composedly, leaning on the rail of the deck, I have nothing further to say. This is the first time the German criminal law has had to deal with a scientific murder, with a murder committed with a bacteria, and the trial proves which has hitherto been considered impossible. Namely, that a layman can obtain possession of the most dangerous living bacteria. An expert in psychiatry who has examined the defendant stated that there could be no question of the latter having inherited criminal tendencies, that he was not a morphinist, <laughs> was not in other ways perverse, mm. and although in many respects he must be regarded as a psychological riddle, uh, he has been and is fully responsible for his actions. Another expert explained that virulent bacteria of typhus, tetanus, Asiatic cholera and diphtheria were found in Hopf's dwelling and it was ascertained that he obtained them from an institute in Vienna. It appeared that the most dangerous bacilli were supplied to his order merely because he had the heading Chemical and Bacteriological Laboratory printed on his notepaper. That was enough back then. Yeah, fair enough. The experts arrived at the conclusion that Hopf acted in all cases with calm deliberation, his sole object being to obtain the money of which the death of his relatives would place him in possession. End quote. That's like a fra sentence I would write. It's like the most bad phrasing of a... I love how they're trying to be so super extra, extra read all about it and yes. then try to be super fancy in the wording. <laughs> Talking about extra, extra read all about it. The Liverpool Echo writes on 19th of January, again, same day, Monday on page six, quote, human monster, <sighs> fencing master to be beheaded. Oh. Karl Hopf, the Frankfurt fencing master who murdered his father, his first wife and his two children and attempted to murder his mother and his second and third wives, has been found guilty on both charges. He was sentenced to death for the murders and to 15 years hard labor for the attempted murders. Prison sentence, of course, is a pure formality, as Hopf will be beheaded within a fortnight. 
he took his sentence with amazing coolness. Evidence given at the trial showed the presence of large quantities of arsenic in the bodies of Hopf's victims. It was also stated that when the police raided Hopf's house, they found cultures of such deadly diseases as typhus, cholera and glanders, which Hopf, who had some training as a chemist, explained by saying that he used them for experiments on dogs. Suspicion was cast on Hopf by the deaths and mysterious illnesses of his relatives. The announcement of Hopf's sentence was received with cheers by a large crowd outside the Frankfurt law courts. End quote. So everybody was happy. <laughs> yeah. It's too bad they didn't make him do more hard labor before they chopped his head off. Yeah. It's, they, they were quick with chopping heads off. Back they then. were. They, yeah, they like got to it. Years and years on death row. That's yeah. right. Hopf's attorney wanted to appeal the verdict on technicalities, but Karl Hopf refused. Huh. Uh, that's interesting to me, sorry. I don't know if he had just made his peace with his punishment, or, and that's what I think, if he still hoped that the emperor, who at the time was Wilhelm II, would pardon him. So chances for that were pretty much non-existent. But it was the law that before every execution, the emperor had to be asked if he wanted to pardon the convict. So uh -huh. that always had to be done automatically. Of course, Wilhelm II didn't pardon Karl Hopf. And so Karl Hopf's execution was set for the morning of 23rd of March, more or less two months after the verdict. So it wasn't a fortnight, as they stated in the article, but it was two months. Okay. I think that's quick enough. Right? Yes. The night before, Karl Hopf wrote a farewell letter to his third wife, Wally. Remember, the woman he had tried to murder for 40,000 mark. And he was still claiming that he was innocent. And not only that, it gets even better. He was blaming her, Wally, one of the victims of his crimes for all his misfortune. No, fuck this guy and the audacity he roller skated in on, honestly. <laughs> Who? Who are these people? How? Unbelievable, right? Yeah. The audacity. The audacity. Uh, you're going to laugh about this. His last meal that he wished for uh, was typical German, or what you would probably consider typical German, uh, sausage, bread, beer, coffee, cigarettes. That seems like a solid plan for any meal, to be fair. I want to go back in time. In the early morning hours of 23rd of March, Karl Hopf stepped in front of the block at the prison. Two guards pulled down his shirt to his waist and helped him to kneel down. Then he placed the head on the block and with an axe, his head was swiftly and quickly separated from his body forever. Isn't it crazy to think about the fact that execution by X was still a thing not so long ago? Whenever yeah. I think of more modern era beheadings, I think of guillotine being used, but no, axes were still being used well into the 20th century. That's crazy, right? I mean, why reinvent the wheel or the axe? It's a perfect job for it. I mean, from a very pragmatic utilitarian perspective, right? Why faff around with a guillotine, which can go wrong? But the execution by axe, so many things went wrong during yeah. so many executions, right? Like the guillotine was a way more streamlined process didn't matter if the executioner was drunk or had a bad day or... Right. I mean, that's, yes, allowing for the various problems that the executioner had that day. Like, not all of them were like the swordsmen of Kali. No. No. Yeah. I just think as executions go, it's not the worst way to go. If if they get it right the first time, like, am, am, was Ambolin a one and done? Two? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he was a master executioner. I mean, he had to come in from France. Right. That's the one she I want. She requested him. <laughs> yeah. I'm always difficult. That's it. That was the end of the serial killer Karl Hopf. So he got his uh, rightful punishment in the end. Wow. That was horrible. Thank you. That was really... <laughs> wow. So many people, so many lives. Like, killing his children so mm. casually... But he was a total sociopath. He had no feelings about anybody ever, I don't think. Do you? No. No. Sociopath for sure. Mm hmm Killing your children, your parents. Mm hmm I really think it was just his greed and, and people didn't matter to him. No, exactly. I agree completely. I don't think anything mattered to him except for him. Yeah. 
Wow, Johanna, thanks. I'd never heard of that story. All right. You have something good? I do. We were able to get up to New Hampshire and Vermont to see the total solar eclipse. It was amazing. If you've never seen a total solar eclipse, I cannot recommend it enough. Both of us have done it and we're fans. It's been 25 years for me. You need to go again when you can. (laughs) But there's also some really great programs out there to pay forward your eclipse glasses. So if you have a bunch of, you know, those cardboard eclipse glasses laying around, Do a quick search and check out some programs near you that will ship those off to some less privileged areas of the country and around the world for the next path of totality. Plus, it's nice to reuse and recycle, right? Yeah. But it was it was nice. It was just nice to get away for the night just for the two of us, which rarely, rarely happens. So thanks to my dad for dog sitting. And we met up with friends that we haven't seen in forever. So that was really special. And also shout out to Claudette and Dean's place in Stratford, New Hampshire, who have not paid me anything, but who had very nice, very nice pancakes. And also the very nice gentleman who let us access his driveway. He left before I got a chance to thank him properly, but I think I found the house on Zillow and I'm going to send some stuff to his dogs because they were really good sports, little chihuahuas, and they were so angry that we were all, his house was like right near the freight, sort of the field where everybody was, was right behind his house. So it was a lot of activity and they were just super nice people. But they vanished inside during the eclipse, the doggies. All the animals did. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And how yeah, quiet everything... Was, I just remember how quiet everything got. Quiet. Yeah. And how weird everything looks. Everything just looks so weird. Like, Washed it's out. such a difficult... Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to explain if you've never experienced totality, but the colors look weird. Everything... There's a part... I think it's why animals get so afraid. There's there's this this feeling inside of you that's like, danger, danger, like... This isn't, it's cool, but it's also like your your lizard brain recognizes that this is kind of scary and you're not sure what's going on. And I yeah. imagine like people 500, 1,000, 5,000 years ago experiencing yep. that and having no idea what's going on. Yep. A thousand years from now, that's how people are going to look at today's ghost hunters, I think. <laughs> Maybe. And that's okay. That's how it goes, right? We all... That's how it goes. We laugh at the people who were the pioneers for thinking that the gods were throwing lightning at us, right? I mean, I don't even laugh because it makes so much sense to me if you if you don't have all the information. Yes, and they, I agree. They just like peeked a little bit through a hole in a fence and we have a way bigger hole in the fence and still we don't know anything, anything. Yeah. We're all just peeking through holes and making sense of the world. That's right. And once you realize that, you don't, I don't know, I find things way less funny or ridiculous, more like, huh, I get it. I get what they were thinking that, or I get why they were doing this. It makes so much sense. (laughs) Well, that's in like last week when we were talking about this guy. I was like, well, he really sounds like a catch. And I think I feel like you're about to tell me that no. No, we never... I can always understand how people get bamboozled. I don't think that's a hard thing to understand. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, how about you? Um, My something good is uh, allergy medicine. I I came in riding on my high horse all my life. Like, I don't have allergies. I've never had an allergy to anything. Never had. How can you have allergies? Like, how ridiculous is it to have allergies? No, I wasn't thinking that, but you know what I mean. Like, I I don't have allergies. Well, guess what? This year I started to have, um, like severe, not, not that severe, but I have a pollen allergy. Like I started sneezing and red eyes and coughing mm-hmm. and my voice being all gone. And then when I went running outside, I kept sneezing and sneezing and not able to breathe, which is fun. It's so much fun. And yeah, I went to the pharmacy and she wanted to give me like, um, some, some real medicine. And I said, well, it's not that bad. We're not going to fire cannons at, at, Little birds, that's a saying we have here. I like that saying. <laughs> Let's just try. It's mit uh, Kanonen auf Spatzen feuern. Mm. Let's just try like a nose spray and eye drops. And that really already helped me a lot. Nice. All right. What else? Ooh, new Patreon get together. Yes. So last week we had 
our new setup for the Patreon get together. In case you don't know, if you're not a member for our murder tier patrons, we do a monthly get together. We started out by playing Cards Against Humanity and nowadays it's more of a chat. And uh, like last week, we talked a little bit more in depth about the Kelly Poppleton case. And it's a live chat with our murder tier members. And uh, we used to do it on Discord, but now we set it up uh, via YouTube. And you can also, if you miss the live stream, if you can't participate because it's at a time that you couldn't do it, uh, you can now rewatch the whole live stream. It's now available yes. for murder and mystery tier members to rewatch. Uh, also, murder tier members, please let us know what time works best for you. We, we are so flexible now with the new setup. Uh, we can try different slots, different dates. That's right. We can record at all different times. And also, if you are a Patreon member and none of the time slots work well for you, or however it is, you can just leave a message or a question or a comment in the comments for that episode. And you don't have to be there. We'll we'll have yes. those when we go into chat about whatever topic we're chatting about. So you will still be part of the conversation, even if you can't make it, which is what I really, really love. It's so good. I prefer it so much. I do too. Good. Also, I know a lot of people are shy. Like they're not comfortable yeah. wading Speaking. into a chat, mm. you know. Exactly. So, yeah. What else? Please. Uh, another way to support our podcast without joining Patreon or joining a group chat or whatever is simply leave us a rating and or review. This really helps us a lot. And it also kind of uplifts our spirit to see, to see nice reviews. And the biggest thing that you can do is recommend us. Recommend us on social media. Recommend us to uh, your friends, your family. I don't know, your dentist. Whoever listens to podcasts, recommend us. This really helps to spread the word. That's right. If you want to know anything else about how to contact us, about where to find our merch store, there is a webpage, freshhellpodcast.com, where you find all the links. Our email address is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we also have a PO box. And that's it. That's it. Tell your pets we said hi, hug them, kiss them, cuddle them, love them, give them treats, take them to the vet. Be kind to them. Be kind to your fellow human being. And hardest part of it all, be kind to yourself. That's right. And if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.